What's going on, YouTube? What's going on? This your boy, Steve Belcher, with Urban Health Outreach Media. What's going on tonight? This is one of, of many live broadcasts from Urban Health Outreach Media. And tonight, we're going to talk about infection control practices and the coronavirus. So if you are a kidney warrior or you on dialysis, this is a broadcast you are going to want to hear. There's no bells and whistles. It's just going to be straight facts, information that you can use so you won't uh, panic and you can just be better educated and better prepared. So let's just start off with infection control, infections and dialysis patients. So long before, all right, long before the coronavirus, there were other viruses. There were other viruses. You had, you know, the flu virus. You have the uh, uh, AIDS virus. You got the hepatitis C virus. You got uh, staph. You, you have all these bacteria and everything floating around. So now when people hear of coronavirus, which again, it's a virus, and you treat a virus like you do all other viruses, this just happened to be a different strand. Probably someone messed with it and it mutated it, whatever the case may be, but it's a virus. And whatever you were doing before, whatever you were doing, protect yourself from other viruses, this virus is no different, okay? So as you prepare for the coronavirus, let's not forget about bloodstream infections, all right? Let's go with some facts. Infection, infections in dialysis patients. One in four, okay? One in four patients who get a bloodstream infection caused by staph bacteria can face complications such as endocarditis, which is infected heart valve, and osteomyelitis, infected bone. Excuse me. <coughs> so the total cost for each infection can be more than 20000 Bloodstream infections can cause sepsis, a potentially deadly condition. Now, how many people or how many warriors have catheters? Even before you heard of the coronavirus, you were at risk for infection anyway. So what were you doing to protect yourself against an infection with your catheter or even with your access? Up to one in five patients with an infection die within 12 weeks. Let me repeat that. Up to one in five patients with an infection die within 12 weeks. And we're not just talking, we're not talking about the coronavirus, okay? You got to make sure staff member, uh, even before the coronavirus, are taking basic steps in catheter care. You know, they, they should be doing hand hygiene way before the coronavirus and putting on new gloves and changing gloves and wearing the face mask and the uh, and the barrier and the PPE. All that should have been done way before the coronavirus. All right. So let's talk about infection risk again, way before the coronavirus. There was information out about infection control and infection risk. We're going to talk about infection risk and how to minimize them. Again, if you have a catheter or if you're a diabetic and you got an open uh, wound or any type of chronic condition uh, where you can get an infection, it can feel like the flu. So you can have an infection and think you got the coronavirus and it's an infection. 
What about if your access get infected? It can feel like a terrible flu with chills, fever, nausea, nausea, vomiting, and body ache. That's the same, same symptoms as the coronavirus, pretty much. The infection may prevent you from getting dialysis through the access. It can even require a long hospital stay to get you healthy. So germs, listen, the coronavirus is your least. If you're in dialysis, the coronavirus, yes, worry about, not. don't worry about it. Be prepared and be mindful. But that's the least of your problems. You're more likely to get an access infection than you would the coronavirus, right? Germs can get into your body through your access. So if you're not cleaning your graft or your fistula well, you're not rubbing that down with soap and water, then when they introduce that needle into your access, if that needle tip is not clean or your access is not clean, or if it's dirty, germs can get into your bloodstream through your access. Okay, talked about that. So your dialysis access is designed to make it easy for blood to get into and out of your body for your dialysis treatment. Unfortunately, this also makes it very easy for germs to get into your body. It is very easy. How many patients have had access infections? You get an infection when germs get into your body and multiply. Nearly one in 10 people on dialysis will get an infection this year. Let me repeat that. One in 10. And if you got 700,000 people on dialysis, that's a lot. One in 10 will on dialysis will get an infection this year. Let's talk about washing your hands again, long before the coronavirus. People should have been washing their hands long before the coronavirus. When you wash your hands, you want to wash it for 30 seconds. Your hands are like little cars that pick up and drop off germs whenever they touch something. Now, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. When you go to dialysis, you touch the door coming into the facility, or do you have a pair of gloves? So you're not the only person touching that glove, I mean, touching that door. Uh, so many people touched that door before you did. Did they clean their hands? Are their hands uh, wiped clean with soap and water or hand sanitizer? Is that door handle wiped down? Make your way into the clinic. Now go into the bathroom. Is the door to the bathroom wiped down? Are you wearing gloves to open that door? Did the person before you wear gloves to go into the bathroom? Did they wash their hands after they uh, used the restroom? Whether they had, whether they defecated or urinated, did they wash their hands? How about when they touched the sink, when they cut it on? See, these are the things that you got to think about because you could pick up germs just from touching stuff. And if somebody didn't wipe themselves or have C. diff, right? Lord, help if somebody has C. diff and you don't know about it. And they go to the bathroom and have a diarrhea episode and they wipe their self and they get on their hand and then they don't uh, wipe their hand off before they turn on the uh, so I mean, before they turn on the hot water and cold water, they could pass that on to you. So, again, your hands are like little cars that pick up and drop off germs whenever they touch something. The most important thing you can do is wash your hands for 30 seconds. You picked up.
So infection prevention differs depending on your access. Okay, let me say this. Whoever's on here, I see there's one person watching. I don't know who you are, but God bless you for tuning in. I posted uh, the link on, on Facebook to let people know where I'm going to be. And this information is by uh, by far uh, some great information I think I'm putting out. Uh just so when people go who are on dialysis, they could uh, kind of settle their nerves and if they prepare with the information, then they don't have to panic and say, oh, OK, if it's a, a virus, then I treat it as such, you know, and then I'll carry my life and do the same thing to protect myself after the coronavirus uh, is gone or is still around or, or whatever the case may be, because it's again. It, there's more than the coronavirus. It's just one of many. So again, infection prevention differs depending on what type of access you have. So if you have a catheter, when you have a catheter, you are at a much higher risk of infection than with a permanent access. So you see, even before the coronavirus, it's literature out that says if you have a catheter, you are a much higher risk of infection than with a permanent access. Your care team will help you understand how to move to a permanent dialysis access. Germs like wet, warm, dark, and dirty places. So if you have a catheter and you don't get to dialysis and you don't change that catheter dressing, and if say it's the summertime and you're sweating, germs like that. Germs like wet, warm, dark, and dirty places. If your catheter bandage gets wet or dirty, it can give germs a free home to hide and multiply. I'm telling you guys, I, I can't tell you how many people I've known that died from a, a bloodstream infection more than the coronavirus, check this out, up to one in five, one in five patients with an infection die within 12 weeks. If your bandage happens to get wet or dirty, let your dialysis team know. Uh, they can change it for you right away or get some bandages, I mean, get some uh, dressings and have them on hand at home. Now, if you have an access like a fistula or a graft, again, germs are everywhere and they want to travel. You don't want to be their taxi driver, right? So if you're doing construction work, if you're in dialysis, dialysis patients vary. They work in different jobs. Anyone could be on dialysis. And if you work outside or if you work in a, a profession where your arm or your access has the potential to get dirt on it, then that's germs. Uh, any surface you touch with your hands or body carries germs. If you touch a surface with your access, wash it for 30 seconds with antibacterial soap as soon as you can. So if you don't have any antibacterial soap, I suggest you go out and get some. And, you know, there may be one item that's not being brought up, antibacterial soap. Also, buy a bar of soap as well. Also, wash your access just before your dialysis treatment. And then, again, just after dialysis. So if you go to dialysis, before you sit in a chair and they uh, stick the needle on your arm, go into the bathroom or the unit may have a designated sink and wash your arm with warm soap and water uh, all over your access, dry it off really good. And then when you sit in the chair, they should be wiping your access with alcohol swab or beta, uh, beta dine, whichever uh, their protocol uh, calls for. Um, so again, you want to get the germs off, but let me say something if you have an access. Uh, report, I repeat, report any signs if you have a, a 
catheter or graft or fistula, any signs of redness, swelling, uh, pus near the access, or if you get a fever, chills or nausea. It's always to be safer to report this uh, and any symptoms uh, rather than ignore it. So let's move on and talk about MRSA. All right. A lot of kidney warriors probably have, haven't even heard of MRSA or what is it. This is what you should know about MRSA. MRSA pronounced MRSA, M-E-R hyphen S-A-H, MRSA. MRSA or M-R-S-A stands for methicillin resistant staphylococcus auroris. All right. So we, we're going to break it down. Staphylococcus, I may be saying it a little backwards. Staphylococcus auroris, often referred to as staph, is a type of bacteria that is often present on the skin or inside the nose of healthy individuals. If, however, these bacteria get under the skin, uh oh get under the skin, an infection can occur. Bloodstream infections often cause septicemia, urinary tract infections, and pneumonia can also be caused by staph. Now, did you hear me? Say if you got a catheter and you got a staph infection, but they interpret it if you can say you get pneumonia and they interpret it as coronavirus. Methicillin is a type of penicillin. Excuse me. Methicillin is a type of penicillin. It was developed in 1959, but later replaced by other penicillin forms. The word resistant means that bacteria will no longer be killed by antibiotic. So again, in that word, MRSA, methicillin resistant staphylococcus auroris. So the methicillin is a type of penicillin right, that was developed in 59, but later replaced by other forms of penicillin. The word resistant means that bacteria will no longer be killed by an antibiotic. So MRSA is therefore a Staphylococcus auroris organism that has become resistant to all penicillin. Who gets MRSA? Who gets this? Staph infections occur more often in people with weakened immune systems. Aha. Persons with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and kidney failure are therefore at a greater risk. So before the coronavirus ever came, or have you ever heard of it, you were at greater risk for MRSA, and you still are at greater risk for MRSA. According to the CDC, MRSA infections are seen more commonly in healthcare facilities such as hospitals, nursing homes, and dialysis centers. Let me repeat that. According to the CDC, MRSA infections 
are seen more commonly in healthcare facilities such as hospitals, nursing homes, and dialysis centers. So again, you were at greater risk for MRSA and still are at greater risk and the coronavirus. So what do you do? When an MRSA infection originate outside of the healthcare setting, it is known as community acquired MRSA infection. With this form of MRSA, skin infections, pimples and boils are usually seen. Can MRSA be prevented? Ha ha. Now look at this. To help avoid a MRSA, well, let me go back. Can MRSA be prevented? Staph aureus infections are more likely to spread from person to person if close skin to skin contact is present. Hygiene is poor. Living conditions are crowded or skin is not intact, as seen with cuts and abrasions or at, at a catheter exit site. This was happening way before the coronavirus. Nobody was sounding the horn then. To help avoid a MRSA infection, the CDC recommends that you keep your hands clean by washing thoroughly with soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. The same with the coronavirus. No different. No different. Two, keep cuts and scrapes clean and covered with a bandage until healed. Three, avoid contact with other person's wound or bandages. Four, avoid sharing personal items such as, a, such as towels or razors, which you shouldn't be doing. Avoid dialyzing with a hemodialysis catheter. Use only when essential. If a hemodialysis catheter is in place, wear a mask. All right, you were supposed to be doing this before the coronavirus. Wear a mask during put on and take off. When holding your access site post treatment, wear a glove and remove it before leaving your chair. You should have been doing that before the coronavirus. Then wash your hands. Can MRSA infections be treated? Yes. You can't treat a virus with antibiotics. But MRSA infection, because it's a bacterial infection, can be treated. Yes, antibiotics other than penicillins can be used to treat MRSA. Treating these infections, however, is sometimes difficult. It may require special antibiotics, plus successful treatment may take longer. Following measures to avoid infection is, of course, the best approach. And that's what we've been saying all along before coronavirus. You know? So if you get fever, if you got a catheter and, and you get fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, don't go overboard and think you got the coronavirus, all right? You may have a bloodstream infection. And another thing that kidney warriors should know and not to uh, stigmatize or put down people with uh, HIV or hep C, but there's people in dialysis centers uh, right now that have hepatitis C and uh, HIV. And you don't know unless they told you. Unless they told you. 
and and people walking around with their shoes off on the scale. They may not be doing it now with this coronavirus. People walking on the dialysis floor with with, with taking their uh, f- feet out of their flip flops and walking on that dirty floor. Come on now. So you got not just MRSA you got to worry about, but it's something called VRE, right? Vancomycin resistant intercoxide, <laughs> right? Vancomycin resistant enterococci, VRE, another staph infection. The enterococci are a group of gram-negative, round-shaped bacteria that commonly live in the intestinal tract, all right? So you got more than the coronavirus to worry about. Although they can cause infection anywhere in the body, they are resistant to several antibiotics, but in the past, Physicians could rely on the strong vancomycin. How many people have vancomycin? I've gave warriors many dosage of vancomycin. So I know there's people out there who's had vanc. Uh, They use vanc to effectively treat enterococcal infections. In recent decades, however, some enterococci have become resistant to vancomycin vre can survive check this out outside the body on surfaces for as long as seven days just just as the hiv virus it can last on somebody bleeding and it gets on the surface and somebody forgets to wipe that down with bleach or it it blood in your chair and your hand touches it, and you got an open uh, cut, Lord, (laughs) Lord have mercy. Um, Let's see. Let's talk about, uh, here we go. Check this out. Why do we dialyze hepatitis C patients in the clinical area and not in isolation. Hepatitis C is not as contagious as hep B. It says not as, but it is contagious, but not as contagious. See, this is from uh, a study guy from one of the big corporations that patients don't hear about or know about. So you got hepatitis B and you got hepatitis C. Hep B patients are dialyzed in an isolation room. So you got someone who has a virus, the Hep B virus, walking among you way before the coronavirus. But check this out. Why do we dialyze hepatitis C patients in the clinical area, in the dialysis setting, and not in isolation? Hepatitis C is not as contagious as hepatitis B. This is the, the dialysis company's rationale for that question. The HCV virus is not known to survive for very long outside of the body. It said it's not known, but it's not definitely. Many patients contracted hepatitis C through con- contaminated blood transfusion in the past or from sexual contact. Over the years, hepatitis C has become more prevalent in the dialysis setting, and there have been instances reported of patients actually contracting hep C in dialysis units. But you wouldn't know if they didn't tell you there has been instances reported that people have caught Hep C in a dialysis unit. We can't contain the spread of this disease, right? 
by being diligent with infection control practices and practicing standard dialysis unit precautions. Okay, I'm good. Um, today, in our dialysis units, you will note an emphasis on disinfecting multiple use items such as tools, instruments, non-disposable supplies, uh, uh, supply items between each uh, uh, between each patient and patient station. That's like the blood pressure cuffs. Are they wiping that down with bleach? Are they wiping the chairs down good? Are they wiping the machines down good? Are they are they just wiping the uh, the um, the ledges uh, where you put your items on. Uh, is that being wiped down? Did you see blood on it? Okay. You don't know if that patient who sat in that chair had uh, HIV or Hep C. Uh, common medication carts that were pushed from station to station in the past are now prohibited in order to prevent the chain of infection. All of the practices mentioned above are to avoid the possibility. So it's a possibility of cross-contamination. There is currently no vaccine or totally effective treatment available. It is a treatment. It's har Harvoni. So there is treatment for hep C. That's if the patient gets it. Uh let's see talked about that what precautions uh should i take when caring for MR mrsa vre patients contact precautions should be taken when working with mrsa and vre patients and so you gotta you don't know who has mrsa or vre and are they washing their hands when they touch the doors when they go out the unit, when they come in the unit, when they go out the facility, when they come in the facility, when they go into the bathroom, when they when they got their hands on the counter. You have to be mindful, guys, please. So the nurse or technician should wear PPE, which stands for personal protective equipment, when caring for these patients. Remove PPE and perform hand sanitation before moving on to the next task or patient. A dedicated gown should be worn for the uh, for the MRSA or VRE patient. Some people don't use the same gown. They go from patient to patient after they work with somebody with MRSA or VRE. CVC dressing should be disposed of into red infectious waste containers after each use. Open wounds should be covered and wound dressing should never be opened or changed in the dialysis treatment room. Hands should be washed for 40 to 60 seconds. MRSA and VRE patients do not need isolation, but they should be seated in the same area, cohorting with others who are also infected with the same bacteria. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, if you, there's one person that's watching, if you on dialysis, I hope you are soaking up this information because a lot of patients going in the units and don't know Don't know about this, right? So they only thinking they protecting themselves from the coronavirus with the mask, right? And they could be touching the counter or the doorknob to the bathroom or the sink, cut on the water or to flush the toilet if it's not censored. The, I mean, it's so much... <laughs> It, I mean, the dialysis unit is so, so dirty. So are they cleaning the chairs thoroughly with the bleach wipes? 
So this is just some things to think about. But this is the stuff that Dallas's patients don't hear about because this is from uh, annual competency exam for caregivers in dialysis. And so this is the information they should know from the company, and I'm giving it to you what they should know. So when you're in the unit, you know you should know you know what they know. How many patients know that? You would be one of the ones privileged to know some information that I'm sharing as an ex-employee of the information that they teach us to know to care for you. Wouldn't you want to know what they know so you can know if they're doing the correct procedure when they initiate and taking care of you on dialysis to prevent from getting an infection? I would if I was on dialysis. But I wouldn't be in the unit. I'll be at home. Okay, so uh, so that was with C. diff. But look, C. diff, when using contact precautions for patients with cl uh, clostrid, I have a hard time with this, clostridium deficile or C. diff, hand washing is required. And C. diff is come out the stool. Somebody with di has diarrhea. C. diff is in the gut. Alcohol-based hand rubs are not, check this out, alcohol-based hand rubs, hand sanitizer, are not effective with C. diff. <laughs> Hands must be washed with soap and water after caring for the patient with C. diff diagnosis. All right. Now, C. diff diagnosis has been around way before you heard of coronavirus. I took care of C. diff patients when I was working in dialysis before I ever heard of the coronavirus. Now, check this out. List three bloodborne pathogens. Three bloodborne pathogens that may be found in a dialysis unit. Okay? This is this is employees training. List three bloodborne are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Now it may be. The coronavirus. I repeat, the three blood, well, no, um, the coronavirus is a virus. It's not a bloodborne pathogen. It's a virus. But you got to be careful for that as well. The three bloodborne pathogens that may be found in a dialysis unit are Hep B, Hepatitis C, and HIV. Way before the coronavirus. What were, what were you doing to protect yourself against these bloodborne pathogens? What is an exposure incident? And what steps should, should you take if you have been exposed to blood body fluids of a patient? This is for the staff. The, de the definition of of an exposure incident is a blood body fluid splash spray occurring to the mucous membranes, eyes, nose, or mouth, or to non-intact skin. A contaminated sharp injury is also con considered an exposure incident. In the event of an exposure incident, you should wash Rinse the area immediately. Report the incident to the clinical manager or in his or her absence, report to the nurse in charge. Seek medical treatment, which should include post-exposure treatment and counseling. 
medical treatment should be sought within one to two hours of the incident. Staff member exposure requires appropriate OSHA documentation and workman's comp documentation applies. What is hepatitis and how can the viral form be spread? All right, check this out. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver due to various causes. In dialysis, patients who have viral hepatitis can be infected with hepatitis B, C, D, E, and are contagious. Hepatitis A is transmitted via contaminated food in the oral fecal route. Hep B and C are transmitted through an exposure to the blood body fluids of an infected person. Hepatitis B is extremely, I repeat, extremely contagious because it can live in the environment and remain viable on surfaces for at least seven days. So what were you doing before the coronavirus? What were you doing to protect yourself uh, against the hepatitis B? Hep D and E are not common to dialysis patients. Why are patients with hepatitis B dialyzed in isolation rooms? Hepatitis B is extremely contagious and can live outside the body for extended periods of time, up to seven days per the CDC. To prevent the spread of this disease, patients affected with hepatitis B dialyze in isolation using isolation precaution. Hepatitis B patients should also have their own dedicated equipment, such as BP cuff and stethoscope, tourniquet, etc. All equipment used for hepatitis B patients and environmental services touched by hepatitis B patients should be thoroughly cleaned with a bleach solution. So even before the coronavirus, hepatitis B, they saying even if the patient touches the surface, it should be wiped down with bleach. So that's what I'm saying. You got to prepare yourself, not just for the coronavirus, but all these other uh, pathogens I talked about. Practice hand hygiene when entering and leaving the isolation room. Anyone entering the isolation room area should wear a fluid-resistant gown at all times. Gloves and a barrier gown should be worn for all contact with, with uh, Hep B patients and equipment. Clean gloves should be used to work on computer information system, keyboard, in the isolation room. If treatment sheets are used, the treatment sheet cannot enter the isolation room. No PPE, I'm sorry, no medical records can enter the isolation room as well. PPE must be removed and discarded before leaving isolation. The gown may be left for additional use in the isolation room if not soiled. The door to the isolation room must be closed during times when blood spurting or spattering is possible. So guys, again, you you were at risk for a lot of stuff way before the coronavirus. Way before the coronavirus, if you go to in-center dialysis, you are at risk for hep C, hep B, HIV. So Let's see. I, I want to touch over. All right. 
I already talked about Hep C. Let's see the element. Now check this out. Preventing. Preventing spread, preventing the spread of bacterial infection, right? Preventing the spread of bacterial infections. Hemodialysis patients who might be at increased risk for spreading germs to other patients include those with an infected skin wound with drainage that is not contained by dressing, fecal incontinence, or uncontrolled diarrhea. How many times have you heard patients say they got diarrhea and they want to get off the machine early? For these patients, use the following precautions. Wear a gown and gloves when you are caring for the patient and remove the gown and gloves when you are finished caring for the patient. Do not wear the same gown when caring for other patients. Dialyze the patients at a station with as few adjacent stations as possible, pretty much at the end of the room. Patients with respiratory illnesses. Now they were talking about this way before Corona. Patients with respiratory illnesses and a fever are at risk of spreading bacterial and viral respiratory infections. Look. Right here. Patients with respiratory illnesses and a fever are at risk to spreading See that? And so it was already, I mean, patients with respiratory illness way before the coronavirus and a fever are at risk of spreading bacterial and viral respiratory infections. These patients should be dialyzed at least six feet away from other patients or any shared supplies. So how many patients you seen if you go to dialysis coughing and not putting on the mask? You were at risk way before the coronavirus. Way before the coronavirus. If you go to a unit and you seen this before all this started, patients coughing and not covering their mouth and hacking and spitting and all that, you were at risk way before. What were they doing then? What were they doing then? So all equipment and surfaces are considered to be contaminated after a dialysis session and therefore must be infect, uh, disinfected. It says it right here. All equipment. Oh, so make sure your station, if you go to in-center dialysis, is wiped down clean. and Because it's considered to be contaminated after a dialysis session. After the patient leave the station, disinfect the dialysis station, including chairs, trays, countertops, and machines after each patient treatment. Wipe all surfaces. Surfaces should be wet with disinfectant and allowed to dry. Give special attention to cleaning control panels on the dialysis machine and other commonly touched surfaces. So now you know when you go in there, you ask them, is your chair properly clean? Is the TV? Because someone used the television before you. Is that wiped down? A lot of staff don't wipe the TV down in the arms to the television. Empty and disinfect all surfaces of prime waste containers. Those containers on the side where they let the uh, saline come through uh, when they rinse in the dialyzer. 
Is that cleaned out? Is it empty? How about when they're giving you your medication? Are the nurses washing their hands and changing their gloves when they're injecting their med into your line? Patients who undergo hemodialysis have a higher risk of infection due to the following factors. Frequent use of catheters or insertion of needles to access the bloodstream, weakened immune systems, and frequent hospital stays in surgery. Each time you go to the hospital, you may pick up some type of bug. You don't know. It's in fact, it's bugs all over the hospital. So dialysis patients are at, are at risk of getting hepatitis B and C infections and bloodstream infections, right? They are. Hep B and C are bloodborne viral infections that can cause chronic lifelong disease involving inflammation, uh, swelling of the liver. Hep B and C viruses can live on the surfaces. Again, Hep B and C viruses can live on surfaces and be spread without visible blood. Come on now. You were at risk for this way before the coronavirus. What were you doing for that? Hepatitis B and C viruses can live on surfaces and be spread without visible blood. A bloodstream infection is a serious infection that can occur when bacteria or other germs get into the blood. One way bacteria can enter the bloodstream is through a vascular access, catheter, fistula, or graft. So if you got a fistula, catheter, or graft, you're at risk of getting a bloodstream infection. Uh, and you're, at, you're more at risk of getting that than you are the coronavirus. So when should staff perform hand hygiene? They should do it before they touch a patient, before they inject or infuse a medication, before they cannulate your access or get uh, access to your catheter, after they touch a patient, after they touch blood, body fluids, mucous membranes, wound dressings, or dialysis fluids, and after they touch medical equipment or other items at the dialysis uh, station, and after removing their gloves, they should be performing hand hygiene, 40 to 60 seconds, all right? They say 30, but longer is better. So when, when caregivers are working with you, they should have this on. They should look like that. Okay. That's how, that's how it's properly worn. So if it's not worn properly like that, ask them why. Because it's protecting you as well. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see how let's recap preventing infections in hemodialysis setting so the key infection prevention practices perform hand hygiene frequently and change gloves maintain separate clean area for supplies and medications and separated contaminated areas for used items Practice proper handling and delivery of patient supplies and medication. Perform effective cleaning and disinfection of dialysis equipment and environmental services. So the staff has an important role as well in this. Carefully handle medications and the patient's vascular access to avoid can contamination. Remember, use Aseptic technique every time. Infections that can get 
Okay, conclusion. Infections that patients can get while receiving dialysis are serious and preventable. Healthcare workers uh, that follow infection control precautions and other safe care practices are the key to prevention. So not just the patients, but the healthcare workers play a key role in this, guys. So make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. Infection control is everyone's responsibility, not just yours, but the healthcare uh, provider as well. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. There's going to be many more as we transition from uh, some shows from Facebook to on YouTube. For the one person watching, God bless you. And please share this broadcast. All right. Um, I'm going to end this broadcast. And if you're watching, uh, join us at 830 on Urban Health Outreach Media for Warriors Quest with Jared A. Brown. Thank you for watching. God bless you. And good night.